if you were extremely self-motivated of individual getting in shape, you wouldn't need to find a gym January 2nd. You would already be at one. So if you're motivated, then you should be fine because you've already been doing it. If you're not, you need to find a place that has an environment that you like. And that doesn't have to mean it's a CrossFit. You know, that could be a lot of different things. That could be a yoga studio. That could be a spin studio. That could be Orange Theory Fitness. It does not matter. Just you have to find something that you like that you can stick to. And once you stick to it, you will get results. It's all it is. Hello and welcome to the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we sit down with some of the leading coaches in the country to help get you ready for your season. I am Pete Hitzeman, the managing editor at BreakingMuscle.com and your host for today's show. Every year as the CrossFit Open approaches, I end up Googling last year's schedule because I'm convinced it's earlier this year than it was last year. And every year, I'm reassured that the Open starts the same week it always has. It only feels like it's creeping up on us. On the show today to help us get ready for the 2018 CrossFit Open is our own Mike Tremello, master coach, programmer extraordinaire, and owner of Precision CrossFit in Agora Hills, California. We cover how he's getting his athletes prepared for this year's CrossFit Games season, how the change to the regionals format has affected his athletes, and why we probably won't see a week added to the Open. Then we zoom out and talk about what you should look for if you're shopping for a gym this January, how he brings new members into his fitness family, and what he's learned from the wide variety of coaching certifications he's completed. Last, we talk about the lifelong mentors who continue to shape him as a person and a coach, and why his 2018 goals have nothing to do with the gym. We're hard at it at Breaking Muscle, trying to bring you the kind of guests and content you want to see in 2018. If you haven't already, be sure to leave us a rating and a review over on iTunes or whichever platform you found us. And if you have any ideas or questions for the show, let us know at editorial at breakingmuscle.com. Joining us today on the Breaking Muscle podcast is nationally recognized coach Mike Tremello. He is Breaking Muscle's own master of programming disaster. He's here to to mess up your body so it gets better, trying to make (laughs) things harder so that everything else gets easier. Mike, how are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing good. I'm getting a little nervous about this CrossFit Open thing that's staring us down. It seems like it's shorter and shorter the lead in every year. And it kind of jumps on us uh, really before we're ready for it. How are you guys getting ready at Precision CrossFit to uh, to tackle the Open this year? You're nervous? My God, I've had a four-month <laughs> break. I'm about to go right into the CrossFit game season. I feel like it just ended. Yeah. Um, it's a very long grind of a year. And I'm, I, can't, I, can't, I have to tell you, I'm not exactly looking forward to starting this. But I guess it's January 1st, so here we go. <laughs> open prep, let's talk about it. Um, how are we getting ready? Um, they've been getting ready all year. I mean, they never really stop training all of them. They take, definitely take some time off and I, and I encourage that. Um, one of the big things about precision, unlike a lot of other gyms is that we encourage careers and college and, um, families, not CrossFit as your job, because it's not a job, it's a hobby. Um, so you're getting paid millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, even still a hobby. So we encourage our, our athletes to have lives and um, they're all, they've all done a fantastic job of building their lives this year. I'm really proud of all of them and where they're going. And uh, they've all accomplished some, some of them have accomplished some big things in the weightlifting genre uh, outside of CrossFit this year, which was fantastic. So that's good to see. And uh, they're gearing up. They're all getting a little nervous, uh, especially with the change in the, um, the regions and the format, but uh, we're ready to go. Let's talk about those changes in the regions. Obviously, they do a little bit shuffling uh, in the regions every year to kind of keep things balanced in terms of participation and expected talent levels. And of course, now we have athletes who have become very mobile, shall we say, to, to get into a region that may be more advantageous for them, or even just to get in a gym that's that's going to mesh better with their training philosophy. So yeah. what kind of consideration does, does that, or what kind of considerations does that create for uh, for you as a coach, when you have athletes either coming in or going out or, or looking differently at their approach to regionals? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it changes a lot. I mean, we've had a lot, we've had a couple of athletes join up the gym because they think they have a better chance with us going team. A lot of people are asking for a new put a, a precision got put two teams out this year. Um, I don't know that answer to that question yet. Uh, I'm, I'm more, if you look at the California regional, when they made it the California regional uh, three years ago, 
everyone who made it individual went individual because it was such a big deal that they qualified for such a crazy region. And then uh, the teams kind of stayed how they were, and everyone kind of put their cards in one deck, kind of just threw them out there, one team, let's see what happens, and took their best. I'm still playing with the idea. Do I think uh, Precision could put two teams out there? Uh, I do. Um, do I think we have the firepower? I don't know. I don't. I won't know until we the first week of the Open what our firepower is. So do I really want to put all my cards on two teams? Uh, I'd rather stack the deck a little bit. That's more what I'm leaning towards just because I think a lot of coaches are like that, unless you're named Invictus. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, for us, as far as athletes are concerned, they de- there's only a few gyms, in my opinion, these days in all the regions that can make it every single year consistently. And you have to look at the... You have to look on the board and see who goes every year. And if you look on the board, it's the same gyms every year that qualify teams and athletes. So if you live in LA, um, you know, Paradiso, it's a great gym out in Venice. They make it every single year. If you live up northern past that, up to Agora, past the valley, that's us. Um, you go, if you go, you got to keep going quite a ways till you get to San Luis Obispo and Bill Grundler's gym in Inferno to find another gym that makes it every year. So we're really spread out. Um, the new region format, I think, helps gyms like that because they're going to get more athletes that want to compete at a high level. Um, but as far as like everyday gyms making it, it's now become extremely tough. Do you think that there are changes coming to the open itself um, in terms of style, format, number of workouts, that sort of thing? You know, that's a great question. I hope so. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think this year anyway. I think they are definitely going to – They're listen, CrossFit's doing a fantastic job of making changes every year to make it more competitive. They want it to be a professional sport. It's obvious where they're taking it. It's in its infancy still. We think we've been doing this for a long time. CrossFit game, first quarter game was 2009. First open was 2011. Guys, it's been seven years. I mean, there's nothing – we expect people to make all these massive changes in a, in a year or two. So it, they're evolving the regional to make it more competitive. They're going to have to evolve the open. I would like to personally see um, open – checkpoint areas where you have to go to a specific gym to get your open score done and then those judges judge you so there's like crossfit game judges there or regional judges there and they judge you in the open so you're not in your comfort zone of your gym i don't think crossfit will ever do that though because it's a that's a that's a loss of money they like the amount of money they make in the open it makes sense they can pay for a lot of the stuff they do in regionals most of their regionals they don't make a lot of money in from what i understand so they so it makes sense financially to do the open and then just combine regions to make maximize their dollar Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the, um, the format change, I don't think you'll see more workouts. I just think you'll see much tougher workouts in the open. Um, and so then the best athletes will make it out of those workouts. Yeah, that's interesting that one of the ideas that I've played around, cause we all like to play, you know, what if I was running CrossFit HQ, right? But I, I always thought that having an additional open workout is definitely a double-edged sword, right? So the CrossFit Open for me is an endurance an endurance athlete falls at a funny time because I'm yeah. in the middle of spinning up for my spring endurance events and yeah. I'm also doing this CrossFit thing, yeah. and I have to be very careful. But uh, well, I know. I think as in terms of sorting out the best of the best, I think an additional workout, an additional week of the Open would be really effective or give them a lot more opportunities at least. Yeah. Um, but the CrossFit season is already very very long. Yeah. And so, you know, you add an, another week of open programming, another week of trying to stay at peak now for six consecutive weeks, which isn't unheard of in professional sports, but it's still a challenge. That Yeah, it's definitely a double-edged sword, but but harder workouts, definitely. I think the progressive workouts are going to be an, an avenue um, that we've seen used a lot where, you know, the weight goes up kind of indefinitely. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. But yeah. well, why do you say that, uh, Pete? Because um, uh, as far as the... Uh, Endurance athlete specter. I mean, I've been training Hunter McIntyre this year, and as you, everyone knows, Hunter in endurance world, he's king, you know. And uh, he's going CrossFit, I and mean, he's he's still an endurance athlete, but he's definitely going to be transitioning into more of a CrossFit based athlete this year as well. See what he can do in the CrossFit genre. And there's a couple of things now where they're going to actually be mixing functional fitness and uh, and uh, obstacle course racing. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple like money events now that are going to be happening in like Sacramento and stuff at the end of right at the end of the April. So and then March and et cetera. So he's going to be trying to do both. And it's a very interesting thing now to coach someone who you want to be successful in the CrossFit world, but also still kill it in the endurance world. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, one thing I have to say about what you said, though, about the um, the multiple stuff in the open is 
an extra week is tough. And the reason why is you have to be a specific, a very different athlete in the open for CrossFit than you do at the regional level for CrossFit. It airs completely different kinds of programming. Yeah. So you have to train. If, you, if you're always on the bubble or you're trying to make it as a team every year, you have to train open prep, open specific for the open, and then change your programming base and train regional base to go to regionals. And then it's a whole nother level if you make the game. The programming changes completely completely then because now it's more of an outdoor sport it's a lot more endurance based more obstacle boards race which is really interesting there is crossfit but it's everything so you have to actually have levels of programming that you do throughout the course of the year that's that's open regional games and completely different types of programming and, and like you alluded to there the fundamental difference isn't just level of difficulty or sort of the extreme nature of the events although that does play in there are yeah. different things available at regionals and at the games versus in the open because crossfit i think rightly wants to keep the open available to everyone so yeah. they can't do things like long distance runs or open water swims or you know the things that not everybody's going to be able yeah. to easily replicate and crucially easily take video of to submit for for online judging so yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely three separate parts of the season. Yeah. But let's pull it back a little bit to the to the Joe Schmuck athlete, like myself. How do you coach athletes at any level to help them figure out what it is they want to accomplish in the open? It's a great question. Honestly, man, we got in the CrossFit back in two thousand fuck, I did in two thousand eight to be fit. <laughs> Have fun. Right. There was open, right? There was there wasn't even a local competition. There was like a couple throwdowns. We did fight on bad. You know, it was a big deal. You know, um, the sectionals came out in 2010. It gave us a reason to compete. And then various competitions have now sparked up. But mm -hmm. CrossFit came down to just being fit. And the idea behind it for your general everyday athlete doing the open is: Did you do better than last year? You know, did your did your skills improve? Like last year, they had a bar muscle workout. Did you get a bar muscle last year? I got one. Awesome. Did you, next year, you got ten. Right. Well, there you go. There's there's your it, the idea. Crop the the open is still measuring improvement, and that's what's rad. You have the scale division. Maybe you went scaled in every workout in 2017, 2018. You even scaled in one workout. You get four workouts that were RX. That's awesome. You know, maybe they repeat a workout, which they usually tend to do, and you finished it this time. Your score was dramatically better. That's improvement. That's what the open's meant to do. It's meant to give you a, a, a test. A lot of gyms, I do this at Precision, but a lot of gyms don't. Um, I test my athletes. I have a, I have a, I have a cycle. I periodize, and they go through the year. And every twelve to fourteen weeks, they'll test. The, they'll test what they tested four two weeks ago, and they'll progress. And I use the open as like the final test. They have four tests throughout the year. Well, for a lot of gyms, they might not understand how to do that entirely. But guess what? They have the open every year. If they sign up for the open every year, there's your test. They get the test. The athletes get the test if they're fitter this year than they were last year. So that's really what it's for. Across it was based off competition. That's why we say three, two, one, go. That's why we say as many rounds and reps as possible because it's for time. If mm -hmm. all a competition, whether you want to call it a competition or not, CrossFit is based on competition. So there's your competition. And it's a little bit nuanced uh, to measure your fitness year to year with the open just because the workouts do change every year. But there's usually a repeat. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, at least one repeat and there are you know, the movements are going to be of the same menu, whether or not they're higher or lower reps, higher or lower load, that sort of thing. So you can definitely see progression. You can check your rankings and your state and your I mean, the leaderboarding thing gets kind of a bad rap, but it's a lot of fun, too. It's like your own little oh. fantasy sports thing that you get to play in. Right. So you a lot of fun for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I hate the but yes, it is, a lot, it, it is a lot of fun for everybody. The average, average, the average open person, it is a blast. Yeah. So, what kind of uh, what kind of workup stuff are you doing, kind of gym wide? Is it, is it a lot of mostly skill prep or technique work, or kind of the, the last two months or last month and a half before you get into the open itself? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, uh, I definitely changed my programs dramatically uh, leading into the open. I started it uh, in the middle of November. Uh, it's about a, it's about a twelve week exactly open prep because you honestly cannot train open prep all year. You ha it has to be no more than two months to two to three months at the most because it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot more EMOMs with uh, with high volume gymnastics, um, a lot of barbell cycling, not weightlifting. As I've said in a lot of other um, 
uh, breaking muscle stuff is that there's a difference between barbell cycling and and uh, weightlifting. Um, so we're working on our barbell cycling technique of the lifts uh, right now. Um, very high uh, imam based squatting where they're doing high rep squatting. Um, so a lot of stuff that breaks the body down a lot more requires a lot more recovery. That's why it's only 12 weeks. Um, we spent the previous year building, getting ready to open prep. So that's where we're at right now. That's kind of a crucial thing from a, a gym owner, a coaching or a programming perspective is the idea that your programming prepares you for the next phase of programming, which prepares you for the next phase of whatever. So it's not just, oh crap, the open's coming. Let's do open prep stuff. It's that you should have been preparing your your athletes' bodies physiologically to be ready for that phase of programming so that they yeah. can get the desired stimulus out of that. So then they can go into the open or whatever phase of competition, whatever they're preparing for, ready to rock and roll. So that, oh. that's kind of a, a global perspective on programming that I think is lost at, uh, at more than a few CrossFit gyms. Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. <laughs> you couldn't say it any better. <laughs> So let's take another step back uh, and get get out of the open talk for a minute. Although we'll probably come back. It's January first. Oh, Resolution or season is is in full swing, and tomorrow morning you're going to open the doors at Precision CrossFit and be trampled by all of the bodies running in because it's oh. New Year, new me. You know, I'm gonna. This is the year I'm going to do CrossFit. Um, how do you handle that influx, both in terms of very temporary high motivation and probably very low uh, awareness of what actually needs done. Well, this year I'm really excited about it because I made a lot of changes to my overall programming uh, about two months ago. Um, okay. I changed, I, 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 it's been advertising breaking muscle under a program for years, but I never actually did anything significantly with it. It was called three levels of programming it was win, fit and perform. So when being like RX level, advanced level CrossFit performance being, I'm going to go to the games, fitness being, I'm going to be fit. Right. Well, I took that precision and I made win and fit programming. When is my standard CrossFit programming for performance? Um, you want to do CrossFit at a high level. Maybe you want to compete. Maybe you don't, but it's, it's a uh, performance base. It's like sports performance. And then fit being, I want to do CrossFit to be fit. I want to look good naked. And I have two programs now that are now listed on the board. There's the win program and there's the fit program and they go hand in hand with each other. And my athletes can walk in every day and choose what program they're going to do in class. And they can also go back and forth. They can do the win lift and the fitness skill and then the win wad if they want, you know, for example. Um, and it has dramatically increased my membership base or the people that show up every day. Cause now a lot of people, like I had a bunch of, I have a lot of masters, fantastic athletes and they're 55 and snatching kicks their ass. You know, they can walk in on a, on a, on a and they'd say it's snatching for, um, for win that day, but fitness wall balls and dubs. They're like, yeah, I can work out now an extra day a week that I, cause I, I had to take snatch days off because my shoulders were killing me and I can now get, do the fitness workout. Um, I have all athletes do it. They come in, they're beat up. I'm going to hit the fitness wall today. This is great. I'm going to great sweat in. The, the, the movements are lower level, but they're there for fitness. You're going to sweat and you're going to move. The better athlete you are, the, it's actually a lot harder because you're going to move a lot faster. Um, so going into this new, you know, uh, January 1st, right? Everyone's going to come in tomorrow, January 2nd to work out. Well, I got a whole program for them in the fitness side. The win side stays the same. That's open prep. They're getting ready for the open. Everyone wants to be fit. They're getting fit. It doesn't change whether it's January 2nd or May 2nd. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing this year. I'm really stoked about it, how it's going to look. That is something that's unique. Uh, there, are, I, I am aware of a few CrossFit gyms that do something similar to that. They have A-level or B-level programming, or they call it something else. But that's something that I think is the next step. It is. Our, our mutual friend Dan Callen is is famous for saying that there's no such thing as CrossFit programming, and it's completely true. And I love to quote him on that. But yeah. I think CrossFit programming is is ready to take sort of a global next step in maturity. And having that selectable mm -hmm. feedback based, biofeedback based programming, you walk in, your shoulders are killing you, or you just you know you went really hard yesterday, and you need to just dial back the intensity today or whatever. That's going to be the next thing. But yeah. What that requires is more thinking on the part of the athlete. So how do you create, <laughs> well, and the coach as well, but you know, the athlete needs to be able to walk on, walk in and look at the board and know that, yeah, today's the day I need to push myself or yeah, today's the day I need to take that step back. Yeah. Um, how do you work to create that sort of awareness within your athlete core? 
That's a great question. I mean, and we, we, as coaches, we, we actually explain our programming in depth to our membership. We talk about all the energy systems and what they need to hit and what, what the goals are. Um, we talk about listening to your body, you know, and respecting the process. And it's, it's huge at precision. It's, 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 it's widely known that to take it that way. And my coaches are fantastic and I coach a lot of my classes too. So I'm able to explain it. So I don't quite have the issue. Um, as far as them not knowing what to do and listening to their body as much as maybe other gyms. But what I, what I have seen the fitness program that the programming has done is it has allowed people to answer, ask more questions. So people that were afraid, cause for example, let's be honest, the fit programming a lot of the time might just be the scale of the normal wind programming, right? Like, but we might write handstand pushups and then on the bottom scale to box pipe as needed. And people would be like, what's that? I don't want to ask what that is. I'll just do handstand pushups today. Like they don't want to ask, but if you write it on a whole nother program for them, they're like, Oh, so oh, I'll do that. That's great. I'll do that. box. What is box piped again? Can you show me what that is? They would have never asked before. So all CrossFit is universally scalable, right? We've said that for years, but the problem is you can write the scale as, as clearly as possible, but everyone wants to do the RX wad because that's what's cool. But if I give them their own fitness wad that's RX, that's cool. So they're going to do that. And so I'm getting way more questions. We're getting way more people interacting with us and, and, and involved in class because they feel like they have their own separate program designed for them. That's not for the elite athlete that's thrown down that's going to go to regionals or the games. Anymore. Yeah, that, that, that's a really excellent point is creating that psychological difference between, oh, I'm scaled. It was just almost like a, it's like a downer. You're like, oh, yeah. I scaled today. And I mean, I scale everything because there's always just some other thing yeah. I'm working on. But a point that Carlene Matthews brought up in the last show of 2017 was scale doesn't mean easier. And that's the first thing I thought when you said box pike pushups, because those things are brutal. They're oh. so hard <laughs> to do correctly. I mean, yeah. It's not easier at all. I would much rather be up against the wall if I had a choice. My members are complaining big time that the fitness workouts are freaking hard. Like, <laughs> hard. I'm like, yeah, it's really hard to go 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, double unders, kettlebell swings, and sit-ups. That shit sucks. <laughs> Take a hot minute to get done for sure. Yeah. yeah. So let's say somebody has not uh, found you yet in Agora Hills, or let, let's say they live in the frozen tundra of the Midwest like me, and they're looking for a gym. They woke up January 1st uh, with a, a slight hangover and a, and a distended belly from all the things they ate last night while they were watching terrible television, yes. and they want to do something. They're not sure where to go. They don't have a, a background of fitness to fall on. How do you shop for a gym? Great question again, right? We're talking about someone who's never really done CrossFit before, correct? Somebody okay. who's, yeah, some, your, your typical, you know, 38-year-old mom, her kids are finally off to college, and she wants to get better at things, but where do you even start? I, honestly, I think the first thing you got to do is you got to look at the coach's backgrounds. Um, so okay. you got to go on, do they have a good website? Honestly, if they have a good website, they, they pay attention, they care. Okay, does their website explain who their coaches are? It should. Um, and if it does, do their coaches have certifications, not just CrossFit certifications? I think real certifications. Um, the CrossFit certifications are great. Um, if you have a coach that has CrossFit level one, CrossFit level two, CrossFit level three, okay, knows his shit. But if you have a coach that has CrossFit level one and the Mike Bergner weightlifting clinic, okay, you know, it's right. good. But if you have a coach that says CrossFit level one, UCW level two, CSCS, RCC, okay, that person might know more. Now that doesn't mean that they're not, that doesn't mean that the more certifications you have, the better coach you are. Because let's be honest, great coaching is the application of knowledge, not how much knowledge you have. Right. So that's one step, but you need to then go there. If they have this website with, with great coaches and, and check them out, is their gym clean? Do they keep care of their bathrooms? It's kind of an important thing. Um, now it's hard to do Do hearts for gyms get very dirty and I have a clean cook comes twice a week, but it's still really hard to do. Also, one really important thing is do they post their programming online? Is it, can you find it? Is there a blog blog? I'm sorry, but I, I and I've, I've had people, I've even had Brady Muscle ask me if I'm ever going to put my, my programming uh, under like lock and key and you have to have an access code to get it. And I'm still so against that. And I don't know. And, I, it's, and, and I've had my partner ask me if I'm going to do it. And I, I, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I don't think what I'm doing is rocket science. And I think that a lot of great jams, Invictus is one of them, and, and, and Ber Ben Bergeron, they put their programming out that you can find it. Okay, it's right there. It's free. Okay, and yeah, the, the program I'm giving my games and regional athletes and my into my trail program, that's different. That is under lock and key. That's for them specifically. But my blog is for you to see and check it out. Hey, Precision's, I've had people join my gym six months. They've been following, they've, they've been somewhere else following my program for six months. And they think, you know what? I'm tired of following for six months in my gym. I'm just going to join Precision and, and do it. And 
If their program is online, that means that that coach and that programmer is not trying to hide anything. And it's right there on blast for you to see it and see what they do and see if their progressions are and say, okay, they, they, they scale, they talk about things, do they write a blog, they write about what they're doing, et cetera. And I think that's a huge, huge red flag that that's a good or a bad gym. I think that's it's definitely uh, an opportunity for a gym to bring the right kind of people in as well. You know, I've, I'm on the road a lot with, uh, with my various jobs and um, I almost will never drop into a gym that doesn't post the programming online. And the mm -hmm. only reason for that, it's not because I necessarily think that it's a pass fail, um, that they're a good gym or not, but I need to know what I'm getting into. You know what I mean? Yes. I've, I've dropped into gyms before sort of blind and yeah the programming was just over my head, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm walking in and they're doing 350 pound farmer's carries for 400 meters. And I'm like, you know, that looks cool, but <laughs> no. I don't know if I'm really up for that yeah. for eight, eight yeah, rounds just, today, you know? Yeah. Just like you, man, I've dropped in a lot of gyms uh, to work out, uh, traveling for these various comps I've had to coach in now. And I've dumped in the gyms and I go, okay guys, three minutes of double unders. All right. So we all do three minutes of double unders. All right, cool. Everyone work to a max clean. You're like, uh, what? I'm just going to do double ones and work to max clean now. Is there, am I going to mobilize? Is there anything else? My calves are warmed up, but what about the rest of me? You know, and it's like, so I, I look, I, I try and look for like a warm up or like a skill warm up when I'm looking. Now, you're talking about an experienced crossfit. As an experienced crossfit looking for a gym, you have an idea of what you're looking for. You should know if there's a plan behind that program or not. I have an idea anyway. And that's also huge, you know, when looking at gyms. Is there, is, does it look like there's a thought process? Yeah, any intelligent person can see there's a thought process behind something. And I think that's important because that's going to say, that's going to tell you how they're going to run their class. Then once you take their classes, is it organized? Are their coaches helpful? Do they coach you? Are they helping you get worn up? Are they working with your, with your, with your um, issues, your injuries? Do they ask you if you have injuries when you walk in the door? That's kind of important. If none of those things are covered, then it's not a good gym. You know, and I don't care if that coach is, is, is Joe Schmo with no certification at all. If he asks the right questions and he's attentive, he's a good coach. It doesn't matter what their certifications are. Yeah, that asking questions thing is an underrated uh, feature, I think, yeah. of any coach, athlete, client experience. Been to a lot of gyms where I get told a lot of things. Haven't been to very many gyms where I get asked a lot of things. And the, the gyms where I've been asked a lot of things have always been the more positive experiences. Mm -hmm. The last point I want to touch on there and we'll kind of we'll kind of segue on is there are a whole bunch of people right now who are on the Googles looking for how they're going to make themselves fitter in 2018 and they're looking to do it on their own. And I'm not saying that can't be done. I know people who have done it. I've done a lot of working on my own, you know, for my own part. But yeah. Is it really the best idea for people to go out there? Hey, I got a set of uh, I got a set of dumbbells, or I got, you know, I got this DVD, and I'm just going to work it at my house. Is there a way to actually have success that way? I think a lot of people these days one of the one of the, one of the main reasons why in my so January second is not a very busy day for CrossFit's getting new members. Um, usually it's March. Uh, okay. At least for at least in our best months are March. January and February are actually horrendous for us as far as new membership base. And the reason why is people want to save money. They just spent a ton of money in December. They own homes, they spent, they bought their property taxes and you name them. They're getting ready for tax season. You know, so they want to spend $185, $200 a month. They do not want to do that, right? They're going to go for $25 a month at 20 Bar Fitness or something like that. It's much more affordable. So, because of that, people are looking for inexpensive ways, um, but they don't realize that because they're doing that, the best thing you could ever do is get a good personal trainer or go to a place that has group fitness because other people will motivate you. Unless you're, if you were extremely self-motivated of individual getting in shape, you wouldn't need to find a gym January 2nd. You would already be at one. So yeah. So if you're motivated, then you should be fine because you've already been doing it. If you're not, you need to find a place that has an environment that you like. And that doesn't have to mean it's a CrossFit. You know, that could be a lot of different things. That could be a yoga studio. That could be a spin studio. That could be Orange Theory Fitness. It does not matter. Just you have to find something that you like that you can stick to. And once you stick to it, you will get results. It's all it is. I think you really hit something, a crucial point of understanding there, which is that – 
recognizing where you are and what you're looking for is going to answer a lot of the questions for you. Yeah. And if you're on Google on January 1st looking for your the cheapest way to get fit in 2018, chances are you actually do need a lot of that help, a lot of that assistance and guidance and instruction that you're going to get from any guided coaching experience, whether that's at CrossFit, whether you join a running team that's got some quality coaching, which is a show I should have another time. I had a guy who, a good friend of mine, he tells this story to everybody all the time. He actually spent Christmas Eve with my family. His name's Jeff Goldberg. And he says something to him that that he, that he said, I changed his life with one statement I said to him. And he and it was like, it was around the same time of the year. And he's he had a lot of issues, uh, personal issues, and he gained a lot of weight. And he was a cross member of mine, was gone for a year, gained a ton of weight, looked completely different than he did when I saw him before this. And uh, he sends me this long, dramatic, drawn out email, blah, 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 just excuses, 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 right? Why he can't do it, blah, 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 blah. I send him back two lines. He tells everybody, two lines. <laughs> and I knew him well enough, so I don't think I say this to everybody, but I knew him as a friend first. I said, shut the fuck up, show up on Monday. That's it. <laughs> it's been a year. The guy's lost all the weight. He looks fantastic. He's dedicated himself. He asks all the right questions in class, and he's and 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 he and he's and he's done what he's needed to do. Yep. And you can do two. It's one of two things. Because where Jeff was going, Jeff was going down the path of I'm going to spend a. You go to one hospital visit. Guess what? That's going to cover your entire monthly year, your year's monthly dues in one ER visit. Is weird. So you decide. Do I want to be unhealthy and not spend 185 dollars a month? For my health and my and, and I feel great, or do I want to just say screw it, try and do it myself, or just you know figure something else out and spend thirty thousand dollars on a hospital visit, which is what it's was looking at these days. So it's it's a, it's all about choice. Well, and let's be real, man. It's not just about the hospital visits. It's about all the things that you end up doing to make yourself feel better about your life, yeah. right? So when I look at the the ebbs and flows of of my own pursuit of uh, I, I hesitate to call it physical mastery, but I'm trying awful hard, damn it. The right. times when I'm most dedicated to my health and fitness are the times that I spend the least amount of money on other crap trying to persuade myself that I'm happy, right? Uh -huh. When I'm dedicated for four or six months training focused, getting ready for a race or an event or something like that, and I'm in the gym and I'm on my bikes and I'm out, out doing the thing, I'm not going out to dinner. I'm not going out to bars. I'm not drinking a lot of beer, which is really expensive as it turns out. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not smoking cigarettes. I'm not doing all the things that I used to yeah. do when I was trying to add the sort of value or yeah. dopamine rush or whatever to my life. So there are there are definitely financial trade-offs. If you're worried about that upfront bill, take the long view and realize yeah. you're going to spend a lot less money on on really yeah. bullshit that doesn't actually make you happy and doesn't make your life better and doesn't enable you and make you a more effective human being spend 185 bucks a month or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And honestly, in California, I understand that's not even that expensive. No, I'm cheap. I just raised my prices to 185, yeah. 165, but I'm still one of the lowest uh, month in month gyms out there. <laughs> so I'm not expensive, but that's a lot for my area because of demographics and how we are. It's a lot of families, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it is different than someone living in LA and it's just them and their, and their significant other or just that, you know, it's, I can afford a lot more for I have kids. Let me tell you. <laughs> How do you develop new members, right? What is the new member experience like for somebody with no CrossFit experience or even with a little CrossFit experience who, who has heard your reputation wants to come to your gym? How do I develop them? Honestly, they have to be, the, the idea is to get them a part of the community as fast as possible, as fast as fast as possible. Precision doesn't have a community. Uh, honestly, we have a family. I tell it to everybody, there's two different, there, there's, there's a big reason why. I've lived in communities. I'm sure you've lived in communities before. Uh, have you moved out of those communities? Of yep. course. It's easy to leave a community. You know, that's, that's, that's cake. But would you ever leave your family? Not if I can help it. Hell no, right? Mm -hmm. So if you create a family environment where people are happy and they're, and they're secure with the people around them, and we have, we had, oh gosh, double digit babies born at precision this year. Like I, I, I did some stupid kind I think we've had 19 babies born in like a year and like 15, like 18 months or something crazy like that. We are a baby wow. boom right now. And I have pictures that are on the site right now of, of, of coaches holding these babies while their moms work out. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I hold my nephew all the time. He's one. I hold, I hold more, uh, multiple babies on daily to, so these moms can work out and but they trust us as coaches and other members to handle their newborns their infant mm -hmm. their six month old and that's because there's a family 
and 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 they're secure. So when someone's coming out in from the outside, the com you have to make it very clear in your blog that your community does tend to read my community reads my blog, and as coaches and and leading by example that you're there for them. You want them a part of your family, and you're gonna do everything it takes to, so that they become become a part of it. Um, and if they if those people that join can't become part of that family within a month or two, like they just they're ostracized or they just they're they're staying off by I don't know, they don't tend to last at all. And that's not saying that they they don't they they can't do CrossFit. It just means they're probably not the right fit for precision because we are going to be your family whether you like it or not. <laughs> and and if they don't like it, then we're not the gym for them. Let me tell you how refreshing it is that the answer to the question I posed, and I left it kind of vague on purpose, oh. you didn't start talking about your on-ramp program and the foundational movements that you're going to teach them and all that stuff. You went directly towards the social and psychological aspects of getting people to have buy-in. So this is something that uh, Shane Trotter and I specifically, with our uh, content that we produce for Breaking Muscle, spend a lot of time kind of mulling over is... We have a societal and a cultural problem with fitness and health that doesn't have anything to do with rounds and reps. That doesn't have anything to do with a clock or no clock or, you know, weights or running or whatever. It has everything to do with the value that we place on our physical and, and emotional and spiritual health as well. You're working straight at that core rather than going, yeah, yeah, today we're going to do this workout. I'm going to teach you how to do double unders. Nah, man, today I'm going to teach you how to be, how to create a value system yeah. and a support system around your health and fitness that's going to keep you on a sustainable path. And I think that's the conversation. Dude, if I could, if I could be CrossFit HQ for a day, that's the conversation I want to start steering. I agree. I, I think they do. I've had, I've had a lot of them really good. I, I've done the level one twice. I really need to go do the level two this next five year when it's up and experience that because I've heard it's really rad. But I feel like in the level one, they, they definitely talk about um building bringing it together as a as a, a from a psychological aspect more than people think i think we everyone gets so wrapped up in the crossfit games like that's crossfit hq and that's not i i i have a happen to have a quite a few friends in the crossfit hq world and they told me crossfit does not make all this money off the crossfit games they make money off their affiliation program and their and their certifications and that's not your games athlete <laughs> that's your everyday coach trying to coach the everyday person. And I feel so, like they turn a profit just off the CrossFit Open Judges course every year, <laughs> like that maybe, ten yes. bucks. <laughs> that might cover a couple. That might cover the games. Yeah, I forgot about that. I mean, they, they're they're brilliant when it comes to making money. Let's be honest. They're, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. I, I've also heard that the CrossFit Level Two course is uh, is definitely worth the price of admission to go to. Yeah. I haven't been yet myself, but uh, I think I got like two and a half more years that I got to renew, and I'll probably definitely. Everyone's been bugging me. A lot of like instructors like when you do level two i'm like oh well <laughs> let's go down the, let's go down the coach development road for a minute right so you've yeah. you've surveyed the field when it comes to certifications you've got a lot of different ones from a lot of different certifying bodies yeah um what has been i want to kind of touch on two things here what has been your experience getting that broad range of of certifying experiences mm -hmm. and then turn that around what do you do to develop your coaches at precision as far as like my certification processes, I think that I learned the most from the USAW certs. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough, I don't know if it was lucky, but I have every USAW cert they offer because they've changed it so many times and I've gotten it. So I have like five of them, but I only have technically three that they would <laughs> list right. right now. Um, but uh, I learned a lot about programming through USAW and, their, and, 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 and I was lucky enough to have Bob Decano, who is legendary uh, with it and coach, teach my level two and my, and my national cert directly to me with like two other people in my gym because he did wow. it. Wow. And you want to talk about just having three days of just awesomeness, like yeah. just you and Bob, like talk about what you're going to learn, you know? Um, so for me, it's been open to learning from all kinds of great coaches not, and, not, and, not, and, not, and not just the great coaches, but like I have a, I have a fantastic coach, in my, uh, my GM head coach of Precision, Jose Cobian, who's fantastic. And, you know, Say what we want between our experiences, they're significantly different. I mean, I taught Jose how to program. I taught Jose about CrossFit. I taught him how to lift. I taught him how to do gymnastics. But 
he's ran with it and he has become an insane coach in his own right gymnastics skill base you know he i do his programming personally as an athlete and i and i love it and i'm seeing he's he's got a lot of athletes now in precision because i can't coach everybody you know and he has done a fantastic job developing some of these athletes that could possibly make a regional team this year or or one of them uh her name's rebecca could possibly make maybe make the games you know as a 36 year old so he's so but i've seen some of his his own mind. He likes he likes to listen. So I always mess with him. He likes to listen to a lot of podcasts, CrossFit based podcasts, mm -hmm. and a lot of like you know just barbell shrugged, all that stuff. And I'm actually not a fan. I don't listen to CrossFit anything. Um, I like science, so I listen to a lot of NCA stuff. A lot of a lot of um, like the re I'm reading the Relentless book right now. Um, I, I like a lot of that. Bill Belichick's book on how to how to win, you know, with the Patriots. I love that stuff. I'm not a fan of the CrossFit stuff. Just I hear it all day, so I don't want to hear it. When I'm when I'm leisurely doing something, mm -hmm. um, Jose does, and and he and he really immerses himself in that world, and he's come out with some great stuff that I have personally taken for our gym for my own athletes, and I think I think it's fantastic. So it doesn't mean that because you're a master coach in your own right, you can't list learn from somebody who's not as high a level of coach because that's bullcrap. You should be able to learn from any coach around. It doesn't matter if they're if they're if they're they've been coaching for one month. Or they've been coaching for 10 years. You should be able to say, hey, you know what? That guy says something that's proper. I like what he had to say there. I'm going to take that and I'm going to use that to make myself better. Um, so what's one thing I felt about the CrossFit certification? I personally felt like I knew a lot when it came to like what they had to offer as far as the programming and all that was concerned. But I will say that their class, I learned the most about instructing that I ever did in any certification I've ever had. Um, and that's a lot to be said because a lot of these certifications don't talk about how to instruct. You take the CSCS on a freaking computer. <laughs> it's, how does that teach you anything? Right. <laughs> you, know, you, know, yeah. you, should have, you should have to do that in front of a, in front of a panel. <laughs> you know, like, and I hear the level two or level three, they do that in CrossFit. So I really like that they're doing that. My only issue with CrossFit, and this is not CrossFit's fault. This is, I guess, the governing body of fitness's fault, whoever the hell that is, is if you have a CrossFit cert, any cert, you can't get a strength and conditioning job for anywhere, a real strength and conditioning job. Which is bull crap. Because I'll tell you right now, those cross level two, level three guys know a hell of a lot more than that NSCA, CSCS guy over here. Because uh, I know because I used to hire them when I was working at Harbor Wesley. And uh, but I couldn't hire anybody CrossFit. My boss wouldn't let me. You know, and he and uh, so the, and that's a big problem that I hope that CrossFit's going after Big Soda right now, et cetera. I would love, and they're going after NSCA a little bit, but this isn't NSCA's fault. I would love to see them go after why can't CrossFit certified coaches get strength, national big time strength conditioning jobs? You know, and that's something that that I that that that's a whole other podcast probably. <laughs> but uh, um, back to my point, as far as how I develop my my coaches, I mean, I feel like I do a better job, but I take the ones that are the most serious, and they, I just take them with me everywhere I go. So Jose's traveled with me to the games, regionals, um, uh, you name it. Uh, NorCal Masters, he's my he's my second in command, as you call it. But at this point, he's pretty much he stands on his own two feet. I value his opinion, everything he has to say. And uh, I will, I coach with him. He doesn't coach, you know, for me. We coach together. We're a team. And that's something that's important to me. Um, I try and I try and make him feel um, acknowledged as much as I can. Uh, and uh, he's the only really coach that's really that into it right now. I have another coach that's just starting who's super into it. Um, and he's always there asking questions, like following me around, making sure he understands what I'm going at when I'm making adjustments. And I just try and take them under my wig as much as possible and give them as much information as I can and then steer in the right directions when it comes to certifications. That's, I think you, you touched, I mean, you covered a lot of ground there, but you touched on a couple of really key points, which is that, you know, the key to your own mastery has been constantly seeking situations to be a student. Yeah. Oh God. Yes. That's something I've, I've that's a common thread that I've, heard from a lot of uh, not just coaches, but just people I respect. Kenny Kane talks a lot about that, that, you know, the, the best teacher will be the best student and, and almost vice versa all the time. Like if you're constantly seeking out more knowledge, then you're going to be very good at soaking it up and then in turn dispensing it. How do you go about identifying coaching talent uh, from within your ranks? Do you look for coaches to kind of rise from your own box or do you shop outside or what do you do? Uh, for the first time ever, I've shopped outside for one coach in my okay. life. I'm, I'm looking for a CrossFit Kids coach at Precision. I don't have one. I tried searching within the gym. We don't have anybody that's available. So the first time ever, Precision's looking for a CrossFit Kids coach. So if you're out there and you want to coach CrossFit Kids, Precision's looking for you. But um, as far as my, my coaches within my gym, I only promote from within. 
Um, and I have a lot of coaches at Precision that are actually coaches and are programmers at other gyms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have them at my disposal when I need them. I ask them and we ask questions. Um, and uh, I, I lost a great coach, uh, gosh, a couple couple months ago, Sam Chang. He's, he's now, he's at Waxman's gym. He actually writes for um, uh, Breaking Muscle, uh, Adaptive Athlete stuff. Fantastic. Okay. He's doing right. Um, loved him to death. But, you know, it's time for him to move on. He moved to Tustin. He's working for Sean Waxman. He's got his own athletes, remote programming I'm seeing right now. He's, he was a guy that I had as, a, as an intern at Harvard Westlake when he was still in college. You know, so it was awesome to see his progression. And so he, he's developed, a lot of my coaches have come and they've developed with precision and have gone on to do other jobs and, and do really well. As far as looking for coaches, I'm always just looking for coaches within that. They have to know me. They have to know my personality. They have to know how I want things. Although I want them to be their own person, I kind of want them to be their own person under my way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's important to me. Right. You know, I've done the mistakes. I don't want them to make the same. So they have to follow the rules and be willing to follow the rules the way I want it. And then uh, when they're ready, they can branch out on their own or they can stick around. <laughs> well, I think that's, I mean, you, you might have kind of downplayed that a little bit, but it's, I think it is hugely important that you have people come in who read from the same sheet of music as you. I mean, not just as a small business owner and not just as a coach, but CrossFit gyms are unique in the kind of relationships that they create. And mm -hmm. You know, we've all been to gyms where, you know, one coach is, is kind of doing one thing and the other coaches are kind of doing a different thing. And there's some kind of internal friction there. It, and it doesn't create a very unified experience for for the members. And one really big danger for CrossFit gyms is that not everybody goes to the same class all the time. And yet yeah. they expect to have a the same or a very similar experience no matter what class they go to. You don't want to get into a situation and I'm preaching to the converted, I know here, but you don't ever want to get into a situation where you've got people avoiding your, you know, 5 p.m. class or whatever, because the guy that coaches that class yes. just, just, you know, isn't cutting the mustard as far as, you know, warm up progressions or, you know, scaling options or, or instruction or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you don't want to get in that place, man, because that'll sink your gym big, fast and in a hurry. Fantastic point. Uh, I actually had that happen. I had a 6.30 class. I couldn't find the right 6.30 coach, I'd say for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, 6.30 p.m., couldn't find it. Like, it just wasn't working out. Like, I was a dead class. I almost thought about getting rid of it. And then I hired this guy, Curtis. Uh, he actually was a coach. He was at Mac. I have to mind that he went to Kuwait for about a year and coached in Kuwait and ran a oh, gym. Wow. When he came back, I'm like, hey, man, you want a job? I need a 6.30 class. I need this and that. And he's like, yeah. And that 6.30 class now has people in it every single night. And I can't say it's because of the program, and I can't say it's because of anything different. The only thing that's changed is the coach. <laughs> and he's been he's likable. Everyone loves him. He's good at explaining. He's attentive, and he's doing a fantastic job coaching these classes, and people are coming, and they're going. I've had people straight tell me they're coming because they love Curtis, and that's awesome because I had nobody in that class before. <laughs> so it's a win-win. It's have you had to move coaches around the schedule to kind of find the class that they fit in? Uh, we have, we don't really do that. I mean, I understand what you're, the question. Um, Jose and I coach most of the classes. We tend to, we're, we're good coaches, but we're very different, him and I. I'm, I'm a lot, obviously a lot more fiery, <laughs> a lot more intense. Uh, I, I, I'm much louder. Jose's <laughs> my yang, right? We always say yin the yang, man. That guy is the opposite of me, but he's very attentive. He's very smart. He's very sweet. Uh, in nature, and he and he he's great at at making you feel like you're the like number one in the world that in that conversation, like, and so and he's he's the opposite, and he's and he he so him and I coach all the morning classes, we switch off, um, and then the afternoons it's it's mixed between him and I and my partner Greg, who's a fantastic coach, and Greg's just everyone loves Greg, he's just that guy that everyone loves, he'll give you the greatest instruction, but he's like lovable. You know, you don't think he owns the gym. No one thinks he owns the gym because he's so lovable. I don't know why, because he owns the hell out of these 50% of it. <laughs> but, it's really funny. Um, we have a Greg at our gym that everybody loves. Who, yeah. Who's that guy? It's same. That guy. So that's Greg. Greg. He coaches in Curtis, and then I have another coach, Mitch, and they all kind of split up. I haven't had any issues with, like, the afternoons. The afternoons kind of flows. But the morning's definitely been interesting. It's definitely been some changes we've had to make in the past with coaches, uh, with Jose and I. And then when I came on board, I took over more morning classes because the coach we had at that time really wasn't cutting it as yeah. far as the members were concerned. So we kind of made some adjustments then. Gotcha. So uh, you're doing all these things. You're programming for a whole bunch of people. You're coaching a 1,000 classes. You're – 
writing books and learning Swahili and doing whatever else that is that you're doing. What is your, uh, what is your personal routine look like? You've been a competitive athlete in your own right up for a lot of years. What, what do you do now for yourself? Great question. Uh, I, I hang out with my kids a lot. <laughs> uh, I left my job a year ago uh, as a full-time strength and conditioning coach to spend time with my family. So uh, my morning is uh, three days a week of uh, making making breakfast and taking my walking my kids to school, and then getting to the uh, gym around ten o'clock and lift. And usually I work out for two hours with a training partner and uh, some of my other athletes, but really it's just with a training partner that I've had for years. Um, and then I uh, start pri private sessions actually or classes which from pretty much from 12 to 4.30, 5.30, Tuesday, Thursday mornings. It's the opposite. I start at 6 a.m. with all my morning classes, and then I kind of go through the day. Um, Thursday nights tend to be really late. I have a lot of athletes that will come in. I have lifting club Tuesday and Thursday nights. It's, it's honestly all day. I don't know how I do it. <laughs> but uh, um, I do train really hard. I haven't stopped training. I'm still the athlete I was. I'd say I'm about as good as I was when I went to regionals back in 2013. Problem is we're in 2018. So I'm the 2013 athlete in 2018, so I'm no good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm about as good as I would across. I'm, I'm definitely the best I've been at CrossFit ever. Um, as far as my CrossFit ability, I've done a couple local. I do about two local comps a year. Um, unfortunately, this year I only got to do one uh, with my wife uh, up in San Luis Obispo. It was a lot of fun. I wish I could have done two. I just the problem is the coaching has just taken over my life. Um, however, I'd rather coach and coach athletes at an event than compete because competing is short lived. And my career is my lifetime. So I rather focus on my career and compete and have fun when I want to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would like to do in, the, in 2018, I'd like to do another comp. I'd like to do three comps. That would be fantastic. I'm actually trying to whittle myself into a couple. Um, I have a, I, we, Precision also runs five events a year. And uh, yeah, so that are big now, 90 something teams. I mean, it's insane how big they're getting. And so there's something called a dynamic duel every year. I'm putting this out there. And uh, and Jose programs it. He's fantastic. And I'm like trying to convince Jose this year to run it all by himself, and I can compete. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to set it up. I uh, I'm a race director for a mountain bike race series wow. here, and one of these days I'll get to race again. <laughs> but yeah, people are like, oh, don't you want to get back into racing? I'm like, I physically cannot leave the timing stand. Like, there's no way right no, now. No. What I've always really wanted to do is, and then my wife knows this, she actually bought me a guitar last Christmas. I've always wanted to learn how to play guitar. Like hardcore, just play some awesome, you know, guitar. And I've always like, I got a guitar now. I just got to get lessons. When the hell am I going to get lessons? You got to find one of your athletes that just happens to be a guitar teacher and then you can trade. No, I, James Butler. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. The problem yeah. is, when, am I, when do I have time when I see James learn how to play guitar? We're working on crossing stuff. <laughs> You, you gotta tell him we're not picking up a barbell until you give me 45 minutes of guitar lessons. That's it. That's my. These are my conditions. Find me 45 minutes to play guitar. Is that's the hard part. So I figure right. like it'll calm down eventually. I, I think one day there's gonna be that end game of some sort where I can move on and focus more on me as a yeah. person, less as a coach. And right now I'm not ready to do that at 35. Um, but what, it will happen. I know it. And when it does, I'll focus on the things I really, I really, really want to do, which have nothing to do with CrossFit. <laughs> I, I feel that pain. Yeah. You mentioned that a couple of months ago, you, you made a dramatic change in your programming, splitting it out into those fitness and competition branches. Mm -hmm. What other 2018 changes or, or philosophical goals or sort of what is your word of 2018 that you're trying to focus on? I don't really set goals per year. I set okay. goals in five years. <laughs> So I don't really have the, a, a 2018 goal. I mean, yeah, I want to see my team make it to regionals. I want to see my game, at more athletes go to the games. I want to I want to show that as a coach that I can be as good as some of the ones that I hold on a pedestal, you know, and Ben Bergeron and CJ Martin and a couple others, that I can be as good as them and be there every year, regardless of landscape change, I'll still be there. And I, I think in 2018 with the changing of regions and the changing of the team structure and all that, I want to show that regardless of, of, of landscape change as a coach, I'm still going to get this, the athletes to the, to where they want to go. So that's definitely a, 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 but that, but I don't think that's 2018 as much as like, that's every year. Like <laughs> you know, right. that was 2017 goal and it worked out really well. I think honestly, I, I gotta, I gotta take it away from CrossFit. Um, I actually was thinking about this yesterday. I really just want to be a better father this year. I don't really care about coaching. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it's going to fall into place. I'll be honest with you. It's going to fall into place. But I feel like last year I, 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 I could have done a better job as a dad. Um, even though I did, I mean, I was, I was more accessible and I took my kids to school and I was around. I just think that at, as they're growing, there's more things I want to be a part of and I don't want to miss it. Is there a, like a daily routine that, that centers you on those, on those goals? Like you have a lot of different things that you're working at all the time and it's very easy. I know as a similarly yeah. sort of, I don't want to say distracted person, but a similarly kind of varied interest person got a lot yeah. of irons in the fire. It's really yeah. easy to just like frizzle and like not focus on do, do all of it poorly and then attempt to doing all of it well. So how do you kind of dial all that in? Uh, I have a really supportive wife. Uh, so that helps a lot. Um, she really, really, uh, takes care of a lot of things, a lot more things than she should, in my opinion, that I got to like, I think I got to step to play more of this year, um, for her to help her. Cause I, she doesn't ever complain, but I know I could, I, I feel bad. So that's how I can balance so many things. Um, but I really, I actually have started managing my day more around my children's lives. So everything's based on what they need. And, I, and I, one of the things, my steps I want to take this year is they went to after school care this year. After they get out of school at two, they went to after school care, we're picking them up at six. My goal this year is to drop the after school care and I pick them up at two. And I have them, um, you know, I take them to the gym, whether, they, whether they're, and they're going to hang out at the gym. I, mean, I still got to work, you know, but they're going to hang out at the gym for a couple of hours and they can manage that, but at least they're with me. And then, uh, so I can, so that's, so there you go. There's your morning. There's your, there's your, um, there's your afternoon and at least I have them at all times and I can like see them and dictate what they're doing that day and uh, dictate my life around them. And that kind of keeps me grounded. Um, whenever I feel like I'm losing control though, I will say, and that happens, I definitely just latch on harder to my family. And then that kind of centers me. And I'll just say, I'm not going to respond to anybody. I'll see you in two days. Um, one of the things I'm doing too this year, I'm going off so much now, sorry. One of the things I'm going that I did this year was taking more vacations for myself. I took zero last year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So this year, I mean, I already, I took a, I took a four day, five day trip with my dad to Mammoth. It was incredible. Really, really invigorated me. My parents encouraged me to do it. Uh, my dad forced me to do it. And I was really, really upset about it actually at first. <laughs> and then uh, once he got me on the mountain with him and that was like my first love with him was skiing. It was incredible. I felt so much better um, going back into the, in back to the gym to work. Um, and then this year on um, Wadapalooza, I'm taking, I usually go ahead of time to see my, my family in Miami, uh, mm -hmm. other side of Florida, but this year I'm taking four days early and I'm taking my wife with me. So we're going to have four days without any coaching or anything, just us, uh, her and I in, in Florida. So definitely more vacations, more time with the kids, stuff like that. No, I love that. I mean, it, everybody has their thing. And one of the things that I've tried to embrace, you know, since I've been the editor at Breaking Muscle is to be sort of agnostic to practice and just listen to how people are actually getting the job done. Right. <laughs> so there are a lot of people who are like, you must do yoga and meditate and <laughs> do incense burning and whatever. I, you know, if that works for you, cool. Yeah. It's not necessarily always my thing, but whatever's going to center you and do nothing for me, like nothing centers me better than like a six hour bicycle ride to nowhere. Yeah. Like yeah. I rode across yeah. Iowa last year. It was like the first real vacation I had taken in quite a long time, except for like some short trips with my wife. And dude, that was hugely centering, sleeping on the ground every night, riding your bicycle all day. And I came home and felt like a new person. That's awesome. Um, it's important to find whatever those strategies are. It's important really? to find those things because you can't be a, a, a flaming torch all the time or you end up burning out. Last question. I'll let you get back to your, uh, your mm -hmm. football watching on uh, New yeah. Year's day. What, uh, who are your mentors today? Who are the people that you look to or your mentors or your coaches, the people yeah. who are helping form Mike Tremello moving forward? That's actually an easy question. <laughs> hey, I have a couple. Uh, one of them would be my college football coach, Dale Weedoff. Uh, we're still close friends to this day. We actually had lunch last week and, uh, he's retired now, but we stay extremely, extremely close. Um, and he's really helped me become, I guess, as a coach, like mentor me, like uh, he was a player's coach. So I try and be a player's coach and kind of the same aspects that he does things. I do them that same way. Butch Pearson, he actually still coaches with me as my USAW assistant coach, even though he was my coach as a kid, <laughs> my strength coach as a kid. Um, so I don't really call, I call him Yoda. He calls me uh, his apprentice still. And that's cool. <laughs> I still learn every day from that guy. Uh, people, I think sometimes people, I've actually been blogs about it. People think that like, Cause he comes in and he comes in, he'll come into barbell club. He'll just take over. He'll tell me to shut up. Hey Mike, look at this. 
hey, you seen this? And I'm just like, I'm like a kid in a schoolroom. People go, don't you take offense to that? Like, you're like you. And I'm like, nah, man, this is the coolest thing in the world. Um, he actually told me this year he wanted to stop coaching weightlifting as much because he's a, he's a, um, he's a, his real job is he's a, he's a cameraman in the movie industry, film industry. Oh, wow. Wow. And so this is his hobby. And he was like, he kind of pays the play a little bit, you know, showing up the stuff, you know? And so I was like, well, I'll cover what you got to cover for travel. And I just didn't want him to stop. And it's not because of my, I guess it's my, yeah, it was because I'm selfish. Like I really want to coach with him. I really want to share these moments with him. He's like a father figure to me. And I started training when I was 15 years old with his sons in his garage. I've literally known him most of my life. And I want to coach with, another father figure like he, i love doing this stuff with him and, and for me i coached the whole year because he was in he was on site somewhere in atlanta and i didn't get a chance to see him for a year i coached two national events without him and it was great they went well but it wasn't the same as it was with him and i got to have him for american Open championships we did incredible and i he was with me the whole time and it was it was the most amazing experience and then third stuff with my father I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have a good father, then, then he should be on the list. <laughs> um, my, dad's, uh, my dad's gone through a lot. He's come from nothing. He was athlete. He actually grew up in uh, orphanages his whole life. Wow. Um, until, yeah, until he came and kind of helped put his dad, his brother, and himself through school and college and moved to, moved to uh, California in the 70s with my mom. Um, so my dad's really literally came from nothing, um, and we're all – who we are today. Um, and my dad, even though it drives me nuts, oh, he's always freaking right. And he gives me the best advice, even though I don't want to hear it half the time because <laughs> he's my father, but it's incredible. And, and he's, and he's 67. So he's only getting older. And, uh, but we still, he still, he's, he, I got to give him a lot of credit this year for the first time ever. I really, really, really appreciated him. Cause he, I mean, more, I always do, but he got me out of the freaking, bubble and made me go to a mountain with him for five days and ski and all he wanted to do is get me the hell away from my job <laughs> so that was rad that's all i mean it's good that you are active with those relationships because i think a lot of people might have mentors in their life but they don't realize it and when you don't realize it you can't take full advantage like the mentorship relationships that i have in my life are people that i seek out regularly to have interactions with because I know that I need that. So having that intentional development is just as important as having intentional development in any other area. If it's your wow. snatch or your clean and jerk or your professional development or your relationships or whatever, you have to actively drive that bus. Mike, this has been fun. Uh, we've yeah. covered a whole bunch of ground. I think this is going to be a great show to uh, help open up the new year. Family, fitness, and uh, getting after it. We'll have to do this again uh, as the open yeah. progresses or maybe after it's wrapped up. I think you're going to be uh, up to your eyeballs. But thanks a lot for your time, and uh, we'll do it again. Thank you.